first thing we're going to do is go straight into a, um, a film that Georgina and others have put together on the search in search of your oral corral, the Georgina Element, the director, and Jodie McGill, the um, producer. So I'll have a quick look at that. Then I'll just talk about 10 minutes or so with a bit of historical background about um, the, the scientific discovery of the koala. And then Georgina's going to talk for uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes about um, her journey in making the film and some of the issues that have arisen from that and some of the implications arising out of that. The first live koala collected for scientific investigation was taken from the Illawarra. It is now listed as vulnerable in Australia, but what is its status here in the Illawarra? Astonishingly, no one appears to know. At present now, in the perception of most people here, they say, well, koalas in the Illawarra, no, you don't, you don't connect that. Chris here with me today in Wollongong Mall. Chris, um, what do you know about the Illawarra Koala? Absolutely nothing. I didn't even, wasn't even aware that we had any in the Illawarra. Can you protect it? Are there any there? There's so much that we don't know and that I would love to discover um, through maybe this documentary. Originally, if you can imagine this without the buildings, it would have been one of the most beautiful places in the world. Yeah, our land was taken and the trees were taken and they were devastated. So they were all cut down. So imagine all the koala bears. Uh, imagine even in, 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 the, in the trees being cut down, Aboriginal people, uh, you know, trees or living things. It, it wasn't only traditional people's lands that was took away, it was the koala's land. Why should every wild animal be managed by a human? Why should we give them permission to live? It's time for us humans to manage us. We need to rewrite that history and give the respect. The European discovery of the koala is quite an interesting story. Captain Cook in 1770, when he landed the Cotton Bay, he didn't encounter the koala. The first fleet arrived in January 1788, and it was over a decade before there was a, a notice of the koala. You could almost say that the home of the koala is the aurora, because the first scientific specimen actually came from Hatfield, which is Mount Kembla, located just southwest of Wollongong. And I, I don't think many people were aware of that. To hear that in 1893 someone took a koala out of the Illawarra, that is just amazing, isn't it? Europeans had a major impact on the, 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 the presence of the koala in the Illawarra area. As far as we understand, we don't have a breeding population within this local government area. Yeah, regretfully, uh, uh, are unaware of any of our population within the Illawarra today. We're currently faced with the possible future extinction of the koala in Australia. There are animal lives a really hard life. University to to become much more involved. 
basic scientific information we're still working on. And when you think of it, here's our, it's one of our best known uh, Australian mammals. We don't know really how they choose their, their food. Um, we don't even know the total numbers. This documentary could be a very great step in encouraging the local leaders to take this issue on. So hopefully the koala will be looked at in better light. And I'm sure it will, because it has played an important role in um, you know, uh, traditional mythology and stories and, and, and stuff like that. And maybe give yeah, not just their people, but everybody a sense of traditional lifestyles and the lessons that are to be learned from them. They're part of our heritage, so it's just the, the history and the culture and they're ours. I think if we let them go, um, shame on us. It's pretty disgusting if we if we do nothing. And he put his he put his hand out for you to hold it and you'd hold it and you could just feel that incredible connect, that incredible bond, that, that amazing experience and you're such a, a soft, precious, gentle creature. You'll arrive home with the Corolla back in 1883 and let's make it the home of the Corolla again. I'm sure you're all very impressed with that film. I think we should put our hands down. Yeah. Incredible that it took 33 years from the time of the arrival of Europeans in Sydney in 1788, 33 years before the end, the koala was actually scientifically described and named. Now, it didn't take that long for the kangaroo to be so named, but it took 33 years. And one of the reasons for that, you might wonder why, well, I think it's the nature of the animal. You, you saw one of the animals up, a koala, in, in a tree, and you could barely see it, the colour of the coat. It's up in the trees, doesn't necessarily come down during the day. So, no one, you know, it's almost no wonder that it was 15 years before even the people at, at Sydney Cave were made aware of the koala. So, Captain Cook, 1770, he didn't, he didn't um, cite the koala. He mentioned a, a place called, a beach called, like a, a hat, hat Hill, which we refer to now as Mount Kembla. 1788, the first fleet arrives at Sydney. Ten years later, 19-year-old John Price put in his journal. So this is the first reference we have to a koala by a European. There's another animal which the natives call a colorine, koala koala colorine, which much resembles the sloths in America. So when Europeans first saw the koala, they're thinking, oh, what does it look like? Is it a possum? Is it a bear? Is it a sloth? Is it, what is it? They didn't really know. So that was 10 years after the arrival of the first fleet. That journal was never published until 1897, I think. So no one really knew about that reference. 
as far as the logging of it point. 1802, um, Ensign Viralia, who's a bit of a, an ex, doing some exploration for one of the young governors, was out in the Nepean area, set, probably just around the Campbelltown area. He secured two feet of a koala from, and sent them to the governor. So he was out with some Aboriginal people, um, some of them went on a hunt and some of them brought back, some of them um, captured a koala and the two Aborigines with Borrelia, they were given part of the animal and they were given the feet and Borrelia thought, what is this? And he said, you know, he got the feet off them before they ate them and he put it in a alcohol jar and sent it to the governor. So that's in 8th of November 1802. So things, they start to think about, okay, what is this? So from my research, it appears that around June, July of 1803, um, someone came down here and got some specimens and took them back to Sydney. Um, from, so that on the 15th of August, we have Ferdinand Bauer doing that sketch. So by the 15th of August, some live specimens of the koala are in Sydney. That's, it's the first time that we're aware of that a live koala had ever reached the settlement. And you might have seen, well, that's rather incredible. But you've got to remember, Sydney Cove was a penal colony. It was a penal settlement. They weren't that interested necessarily primarily in discovering the land. They were interested in keeping those walls up, keeping the convicts at bay. So, you know, they had the rum rebellion. They had a lot of turmoil. So that scientific discovery was not necessarily a big priority. But fortunately, in 1803, around August, they had in, in Sydney two of the most um, significant scientists and artists of, of the period. It was Ferdinand Bauer, an incredible botanical and, and um, able to draw flora and fauna, and Robert Brown, one of the um, you know one of the major scientists of the period, um, botanist and able to describe and uh, name animal species, all sorts of things. So Bauer and and Brown were working with Flinders, Matthew Flinders, associated with this boat here. And they just happened to be in Sydney at the time, so that when the koalas rocked up, we had Robert Brown, one of the most preeminent scientists in the world, was actually able to describe him. Unfortunately, he wrote everything in Latin. I'm fortunate for me, but if you're in the room and you can translate Latin, I know there's one person who can translate Latin, and also can translate Latin. In the room, it's not, so it's quite difficult. So, Bauer, uh, Brown described the animal in his notes, quite uh, copious notes, he described the animal. Um, Bauer sketched the animal, and a week or so later, Sydney Gazette reported on a new species, which they call the new species of wombat. So all of a sudden, during these months, August and September, the koala is discovered in Sydney. Um, um, Bauer does some sketches. Rock, John W. Lewin did a watercolour of the koala, which was sent to um, Sir Joseph Banks. Everything, everything went to Sir Joseph Banks in London. So Lewin's sketch, Lewin's watercolour, was basically it seems to be a copy of Bauer's original sketch. Robert Brown sent a letter to Banks, calling the animal a didelphus koala koala. So he's getting the original words right. Didelphus is related to a possum. So that he was yet to really scientifically describe it. George Cayley, another local scientist, um, also um, made reference to it. That's Hatfield, because in, in, his, in his Latin description, he... Can you tell us what that says, Joe? Uh, in the woods and the roots of the mountain, um, near Hatfield, um, I found this eucalyptus foliage. You know, amid the eucalyptus foliage, that's where I found it. Yeah. So basically, if we, if we take a read of that, we can say that, that, this, that that's, um, that's his description of the koala specimen that we brought to Sydney and we're saying it's from Hat Hill. Oh, yeah, he's got it on the roots too there, so he's, he's actually translating directly from the Latin. See how the roots in the picture? Oh, right. There, there. Where's that? Well, the thing he's sitting on appears to be a tree root. Oh, OK. And in oh, that description, okay. he says, in the woods and the roots. Yeah, oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is one of the drawings um, that one of the Sydney artists did, and a copy of this was sent over to Joseph Banks in London. Um, some of the animals, they, they died or whatever, they, some of the animals were purchased. So once, once all this started happening in August, September, 
Um, more animals were, were secured. Some were sent over to um, England. The first live specimen got to England in 1887 or 1888. So they didn't see a rural life koala for, for a long, long time because they were such a fragile animal. So in 1804, so I'll just quickly talk about the scientific description and discovery because um, they had the animals now and now they needed to, to name and describe them and put them into the historic record, the scientific record. So in March 1804, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patterson sent a letter to, to Banks, including a description with, with parts of a specimen, probably the skin, some bones, etc. It took four years later before it was talked about at the Royal Society. Now, for some reason, there was a big delay. Brown, Robert Brown, never published any of his notes on the koala, so his initial description never appeared anywhere until the 1990s. Um, Ferdinand Bauer's pencil sketch was never really published. So we can forget about what Bauer and Brown did, because no one ever knew about it. All of a sudden, it was up to other people. Um, in 1810, the first published image of the koala was appeared, and it looks like it was, a, a, and I'll, I'll show, that was the first published, and that was based on a stuffed model in the London um, Zoological Garden place. So that was in 1810, so all of a sudden a stuffed koala is on display in London. But even then the British scientists didn't do anything. It was up to H.M. de Blainville, who was a French, um, I don't know the, the, the term for someone who describes um, and names animals and that, but he saw this specimen in London and he allocated a genus named Flasco lactos, Greek for pouch bear, to the animal in 1814. In 1817, a German goldfish called the koala like Furious cinerus. The cinerus refers to the colour, the, the grey colour. So the, in 1821, uh, G. A. Waterhouse and English scientists finally said, okay, we'll call it Plasco Lactus cinerus. And that was the point at which it was, it was finally described. And that's the name by which it's known today. So that took a long time to happen, and it really could have happened in 1803 with Brown and Bauer, if, if, um, if Robert Brown had it published. <coughs> so there's two pictures, that's from 1810, this is a French from one from 1817, so they had no idea what, you know, what was going on there. Because <laughs> as I said, the live animal never reached, never reached um, the continent, never reached Britain anyway, to the 1880s. Just, just to close on my bit, this is some of the um, sketches, some of the watercolours from 1814 by Ferdinand Bauer. You can see he's a supreme artist, incredible, incredibly beautiful drawings of, of the um, koala. 1814, this is basically and the original pencil sketch. You can't see that, but it's incredibly detailed work. So that's, that's a bit of a brief rundown on the scientific history of the science, the European film discovery of the koala. So what I'll do is just hand over to Georgina now and she's going to just talk a little bit about her film and some of the issues arising out of it. Hi. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room would uh, like to join me in gratitude to Michael Organ for um, his fascinating research into the discovery of the koala. This um, is really significant, not only just for, for all of Australians who love koalas, but for the Illawarra, um, um, who largely have been unaware of this connection. Um, my producer Jodie McGill and I would like to thank Michael for uh, inviting us to share our short uh, film with you guys. Um, and had Michael not done his research, our little film would never have been made. So. Again, just the importance of when you find something out, when you research, just making it freely available. Um, we're very grateful that it's so generous. So, I'm a conservator of cultural materials, and people often confuse conservators with people that um, preserve uh, or look after the environment, and uh, generally it's not the case. Uh, we preserve objects of cultural significance. But in this case, the lines are a little bit blurred. 
I arrived in Mount Kembla 10 years ago, not knowing a soul. My husband was uh, doing full-time study at this university. And I was wondering what to do for a job, and clearly there was a huge demand for conservators in the Illawarra. Um, so I did what, what I do best, and I got involved in the history of my local area, and um, started researching about Mount Kembla's history late at night, um, my kids, you know, driving me crazy and just like my little escape going to another Google search on Mount Kembla. And after a few years of this, I found uh, Michael Organ's paper popped up after, you know, a few pages into the Google search. And I couldn't believe what I, what I was seeing because Mount Kembla has a community of uh, a lot of people that are interested in its local history and nobody I knew knew of this connection. And the more I started to talk to people about it, nobody knew. And I thought, how could this be? Here is um, this amazing connection between the Illawarra and our national icon, and nobody knows about it. Um, you know, surely it would be a case for explo exploitation by advertising agents or, you know, tourism Wollongong at least. So a few years later, National Park Service Ranger Jodie McPhil and I, we were talking about this and going, this is crazy. So we decided to do something about it. Uh, armed with a borrowed camera and a telephone, Jodie started ringing people up and one of the, our first interviewees was um, Michael. At the time, the koala was in the news a lot because uh, they were wanting to put it on the National Endangered Species List. It um, achieved vulnerable status in New South Wales. So what Michael's paper did was raise a whole series of questions. What has happened to the koala since 1803? Are they still out there in the bush? Is anyone looking out for them? Is anyone researching them? Uh, did council have a koala protection plan as some of the other local councils? Um, actually, we were really shocked to discover that there was an almost complete absence of information on the koala in the Illawarra. And our questions to local leaders, to federal representatives, state representatives, were usually answered with the same question. Are there any koalas in the Illawarra? So local council, along with uh, local wildlife parks, pretty much assumed local extinction. It appeared that habitat destruction and possibly hunting um, for, for their fur in the 1920s had wiped them out. Or is this a too convenient assumption? If we don't know they're there, then we can wash our hands of any responsibility. National Parks and Wildlife Service and Sydney Catchment Authority pointed to their web pages and provided little more than generalised statements about that their lands were habitat for local um, flora and fauna, and yes, koalas could be part of that. Um, the Koala Foundation, they provided information on available habitat in Illawarra and mapping, and when we interviewed Wires, they reported recent um, rescues from the Shoalhaven, Southern Highlands, Campbelltown, and the Shire areas. Notice, that's all of our neighbours. Dr. Robert Close, who's been studying uh, koalas uh, for 20 years in the, in the Campbelltown region, he said given the habitat between Campbelltown and the Illawarra, and uh, the fact that koalas can actually travel 20 to 40 kilometres, the likelihood of them being here is high. Dr. Laurie Chisholm, who you saw um, from the University of Wollongong, she discussed with us uh, tools that are now available to uh, study the koalas and their habitats, such as spectral imaging that can fly over and take an analysis of, of the canopy and pinpoint koala food trees. And our hope is that the University of Wollongong will take this issue on and show leadership within the Illawarra, as clearly nobody else is doing so. This short five minute film was just a snippet, just the starting point um, we conducted lots of interviews and we couldn't share them all with you today, but um, there were stories such as a pioneering family who had a uh, lot of sons and the sons would go hunting in the Cordo Valley and after time were able to collect enough uh, skins to make their mother a warm koala skin blanket. Um, there's a sad story about during the depression years when people in desperation were forced to hunt the koalas for food. And we've also captured a few uh, Darawal stories about the koala that prove the uh, long association between the koala, the Illawarra and the Darawal 
and how important it is to seek their knowledge. And we hope to entice all of you and everyone to join with us to bring back the Twilight to the hearts and minds of the Illawarra. And shortly I will be uploading um, Michael's entire interview, so at least that's online and you can watch it because, no, it's, it's just, I, I just think this story is amazing and I just can't believe people don't know about it, so we want to get the word out there. So in closing, I just want to leave with you that the koala has had a long, long association with the Illawarra, whether we choose to acknowledge that or not. We're only here for a really short time and armed with this knowledge, we should do all we can to make sure that the koala um, remains uh, in its traditional lands for a long time. Has there been any kind of like organised search for them around here at all? No. Oh, I think in the 60s somebody did do, um, I forgot my fellow's name, he did do some research, but at the moment, no. At the moment, all we have to go on is incidental sightings. Uh, National Parks and Wildlife do have Bionet, which um, records these incident, incidental sightings. And they've got 40 records for our area. Um, and most of them, I think the earliest one on there is uh, for 1940 something to oh, 2012. But interestingly, they don't have on there Michael's discovery of the first one, which should be on there pinpointing it. Um, but you know, what we want to see, uh, the thing is, you know, we all know koalas are suffering from chlamydia, and apparently Campbelltown population is a really healthy uh, population. And as the koalas move into other areas, will they encounter uh, chlamydia? You know, we need to know about the health of the animals. Um, so, yeah, we would love to see the university use its students and its contacts and its technology to go out there and, and do uh, a really thorough search. And, you know, we're the historical home of koala. Why not be um, the ones to champion the koala?